Let's try taking the P of 10. You had to think a little bit about some of those steps, but it looks like you came up with the right answer. Now, the first thing you did is you rewrote this in scientific notation, like this. Now, it's OK. However, um, this is a, a case that's similar to the previous case. There's no point really writing a coefficient of 1. The coefficient of 1 is just going to confuse us here, as I think you eventually saw. Why don't we just write this as p of 10 to the first power? Because we know how to take that p. So we can just drop a coefficient of 1. And we know that p is the negative exponent. So we ended up with a p of negative 1. OK, good. All right. So let's try this the p of 4 times 10 to the 7th. The p of 4 times 10 to the 7th. Maybe that's a little big. Uh, let's try this. The p of 4 times 10 squared p of 4 times 10 squared. All right, I think you ultimately came up with the right answer there, but there were definitely some problems in uh, the scratch work. So let's go through that. So we started with, so Let's start by using our trick of just focusing on the number. So you did that, so that was good. You started by just focusing on the number and forgetting about the p. So we could just write down the number, 4 times 10 squared, and just forgetting about the p for the time being. So that's good. And then our trick here is to compare this to just simple powers of 10. Just to compare this to uh, simple powers of 10. Oh, now that I think about it, maybe uh, you didn't come up with the right answer. Okay. So, yeah, but you can see, even me, it's hard to do it without looking at the scratch work. So, the power of 10 you compare this to is 10 squared. So that's good. And 10 squared is less than this. So that was good. However, the step that you left out is I don't think you put in an upper bound. I think, I think things would have been much clearer if we had put in an upper bound over here. So what would be an upper bound power of 10 that we could put in? 10 to the what power? 10 to the third power. That's right. So this was the part you left out. But remember, this was what we were doing for the logarithms a second ago, putting in both bounds. The easy bound is 10 squared, because that was the power of 10 we started with. But since 10 squared is smaller than this number, we should also put in an upper bound. Why don't we go through the rest of this together, then, when you're ready? OK. OK. Now that we have our bounds on the number, now we can take the p of everything. Now, when we take the p of this inequality, is the inequality going to keep the same direction or flip its direction? Flip. Flip. And why is that? Well, let's review those ideas. Going back to logarithms for a second, when x gets bigger, what happens to the log of x? It gets bigger. But how about when x gets bigger, what happens? to the p of x. It's smaller. Yeah, and that is because the p of x is the negative log of x. And this negative sign turns this direct relationship into an inverse relationship. We know there's a direct relationship between x and its logarithm. But because of this negative sign, there's an inverse relationship between x and p of x. The bigger x is, the smaller its p is going to be. Mm -hmm. All right, and that's why when we take the p of everything, we have to flip the inequality. And last time we saw that the best way to flip the inequality, the best way to flip the inequality is not to flip the inequality signs. We want to keep the same inequality signs, but I'm simply going to take the 10 to the third term and put it on the far left. Then I can still take this p of the middle term. And then I can take this 10 squared term and put it on the far right. 
And we can see that has to be the case um, because the smallest number should have the biggest p. The smallest number should have the biggest p because there's an inverse relationship between a number and its p. So when we take the p of everything, all the inequality flips around. We saw this is a much less confusing way to work than flipping the inequality signs. Because on a number line, you always put the smallest number on the left. On a number line, you would always put the smallest number on the left and the biggest number on the right. But if we flip the inequality signs, we would have the bigger numbers on the left and the smaller numbers on the right. And that tends to be confusing. So we decided we wouldn't use this type of inequality sign. We're not going to use this because uh, this doesn't represent the way a number line works. A number line, a number line always works like this, with the smaller numbers on the left and the bigger numbers on the right. So we'll flip the inequality just by flipping the positions of the numbers. OK. Now, what is p of 10 to the third power? Not positive 3, but negative 3, because it's a negative log. I don't do anything in the middle. This is the p that we're trying to approximate. And what's the p of 10 squared? Minus 1. OK. So I think that your original guess, your original guess was that the p was between negative 2 and minus 1. Mm -hmm. And at first, I agreed with you. You can see without actually carefully working it out on paper, it's really easy to make mistakes. So I made that same mistake. So this is why we've been trying to be so meticulous in all of our work up to, up to this point, because without this meticulous work, it's very easy to make these careless mistakes when you're doing these approximations. So you can see this is almost the same method we did when we were taking logarithms. It's almost the same exact method for logarithms. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that when you take the logarithm of all the numbers, the inequalities keep the same direction. But when you take the p of all the numbers, you have to flip the positions uh, in the inequality. But otherwise, this is the same exact approach. And the big thing, again, that we left out the first time is we left out the upper bound. Putting in this upper bound really helps us to, to, to think through the problem. You know, I think the last time we worked through this, I think we made a lot of progress on working on these, on our notation. But even last time we worked on this, I think we maybe were not putting in the upper bound. I think maybe we were only putting in one bound. Uh, but you can see this, this is even better than we had last time. It's better to have both bounds so that you know exactly what the, num what the number is going to be between. So uh, I think we made some improvements in our notation last time. But hopefully this will be our final and most improved notation. Uh, yeah, we, we didn't have an upper bound. Right. So going forward, uh, you might want to use today, your notes from today's session as your main notes for how to take logarithms and how to take the p, because uh, we had pretty good notation last time, but now I think, hopefully now the notation is perfect. So we got that this was between negative 3 and negative 2. That's the best we can do without a calculator, and again, that should be a good enough approximation for your test. All right. So uh, when you're reviewing after today, I guess you should mainly focus on how we did the problems today. Because our notation last time was still not quite as good as it is today. Did I make a mistake? Oh, uh, yeah, I guess I wrote down the wrong exponent here, huh? This should have been 10 squared? Yeah, I was just miscopying. So I meant to say this is 4 times 10 squared. Okay. Uh, that was the p we were trying to take in the first place, 4 times 10 squared. So that should be our number. Okay. Do we keep going? Yeah. Okay. Now, um, by the way, let's just remember how this would come up on a real chemistry problem. Well, if you were doing a real chemistry problem, you might have figured out, aha, the hydronium concentration is 4 times 10 squared molar. And then you might be asked, What's the pH? Well, you know the pH is the P of the hydronium concentration, so you basically be taking the P of 4 times 10 squared. And that's exactly what we just reviewed how to do here, how to take the P of 4 times 10 squared. Normally, it's a little unusual in the textbook to actually write the number next to the P. Right. They just say, I'm taking the pH. But actually, this is good notation to actually write the number next to the P so you can actually see what you're actually doing. Right. And then what would be the answer? Well, we can see that the pH of the solution is between negative 3 and negative 2. Mm -hmm. That would be a good enough approximation. It's approximately between negative 3 and negative 2. By the way, this might strike you as a little bit weird, because are pHs usually positive or are they usually negative when you find pH? Positive. Yeah, a normal pH, because remember, what's the neutral pH? 
neutral pH is 7, so a normal pH would be something like 4, which is acidic, or 10, which is basic. So it might seem a little bit weird to have a negative pH, but this could definitely happen. Does this mean a very basic solution or a very acidic solution? Very acidic. Yeah, very acidic, because anything less than 7 is acidic. So say a pH of 3 would be somewhat, uh, would be somewhat acidic, and a pH of 2 would be more acidic. Well, a pH of uh, negative 2 or negative 3 is extremely acidic, but this is totally possible. It's not that unusual. Uh, if you put in uh, a considerable amount of strong acid, you can easily get a negative pH. So there's nothing bizarre about having a negative pH. Notice it just happens, uh, yeah, no, there's nothing really bizarre about having a negative pH. If you, have a high if you have a big hydronium concentration, you'll get a negative pH. All right, so even though this is not the usual case, uh, it definitely uh, is not that bizarre and it could come up. So it's good to see how to deal with this.